co-chair of the Civil Rights and Equal Opportunity Committee of the ABA section of Civil Rights and Social Justice. We're thrilled to be presenting a timely webinar, the sixth annual State of Voting Rights. This panel is one of many in a series of the section's rapid response webinars. We are actively planning additional programming on a variety of issues, so please visit AmericanBar.org slash CRSJ for updates on these programs. Uh, before we get going, I want to thank a few people who have helped not just with this program, but with the amazing work of the section of civil rights and social justice. Uh, first of all, our section chair, Beth Winnenberry, my fellow co-chairs of the Civil Rights and Equal Opportunity Committee, Jamie Hawk, Myra McKenzie Harris, and Kathleen Yanahara, and Wendy Mariner and Cynthia Swan, who lead our task force on fair elections and voting rights. But most importantly, thank you to the amazing staff of the section, Paul Shapiro, Ali Kielsgaard, and Ruchika Sharma. Our section has remained committed to educating members of the bar and the public on the state of voting rights. And this panel was born six years ago with that purpose in mind. Today, we find our democracy in crisis. The myth of voter fraud, the big lie surrounding the 2020 election, and the January 6th insurrection has created an environment where voting rights and our very elections are at risk. We are lucky to have a stellar panel today to address all issues surrounding our democratic system. So just the housekeeping note, uh, during today's program, we encourage you to ask questions of our panelists through the Q&A, not the chat function. If you do not see the controls, please ensure your screen is not idle. We will address questions at the end of the program, and some of them we'll try to take on during the program as well. Uh, we will also be sharing a recording of this program to everyone who is registered so that you can share it widely with your own networks. I will briefly introduce our panel, but then we'll allow them to start off by giving a much further, fuller, excuse me, introduction of their own work, scholarship, efforts, and advocacy in this area. They all have contributed an extraordinary amount already to this discussion. Uh, so we'll go in alphabetical order. Uh, first, uh, Amir Badat, who is voting special counsel and manager, voting rights defender and prepared to vote projects, the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund, Inc. Uh, Jacqueline DeLeon, staff attorney at the Native American Rights Fund. Adisu Demisi, executive director, more than a vote. And Professor Rick Casson, Chancellor's Professor of Law and Political Science, University of California, Irvine School of Law, and also co-director of the Fair Elections and Free Speech Center at University of California, Irvine School of Law. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our panel. Uh, Amir, we're gonna start with you and we'll go alphabetically through introductions. Thanks so much, Jason. Um, thank you to the ABA for hosting this. Uh, I'm really excited to participate today with such a stellar group of folks on the panel. Um, like Jason said, I am the manager of the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Funds Prepared to Vote and Voting Rights Defender Projects. Uh, that's a mouthful. We like to call it PTV VRD. Um, and PTV VRD is responsible for LDF's election protection efforts. Um, these efforts arose in recognition of the gap left by Shelby County's elimination of the federal preclearance requirement in Section 5. Um, and you know, without the ex ante check of the DOJ's um, preclearance requirement, um, we created the, these election protection programs um, as a way for private parties and advocacy groups to help <clears throat> enforce the requirements of um, federal law. Uh, so our Prepared to Vote project, um, which has existed for over a decade now, is um, our election time election protection effort. So on election day and during the early vote periods, uh, we have people monitoring election problems on the ground and remotely responding to them in real time and providing um, critical election related information to voters. Um, we established the Voting Rights Defender Project about two years ago in recognition that election protection really needs to be a year round effort. Um, and so many of the problems that we saw during during election day or during the early vote period stemmed from decisions that were being made months in advance of, of election day. So uh, we in VRD, we, we leveraged the skills and the resources that we have in our election time, election protection efforts. So the organizing, the local partnerships, the um, election administration um, efforts, and, and we use those during the entire year. Um, so we do election administration advocacy, legislative advocacy, 
We monitor election related issues throughout the entire year. And we work with our local partners um, in the states that we're targeting, um, which are primarily in the deep south in states that were um, covered by section five. Um, and in addition to the, my PTV VRD work, I'm also voting special counsel. So I do voting rights litigation um, with LDF and we have several voting rights cases um, that we're currently litigating right now um, that I'm sure we'll talk about a little bit later. Thanks, Samir. Uh, Jacqueline. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for having me on this distinguished panel. And thanks to the ABA and the Civil Rights and Social Justice section for putting this together. Um, so I'm Jacqueline. Um, I am a staff attorney with the Native American Rights Fund. The Native American Rights Fund is the nation's largest and oldest nonprofit dedicated to advancing the rights of Native Americans. Um, and we have been doing voting rights work for the past 50 years. Um, in 2015, we began a coalition uh, that uh, of you know, uh, regional organizations, national organizations, local get out the vote organizations that work in Indian country to start investigating the question of you know, why are voting rates so low in Indian country? Um, and I'm proud to uh, you know, uh, do a lot of that work. My portfolio is mostly voting rights. Um, and uh, so I, I got started um, leading a series of field hearings across Indian country, nine total that sort of asked the question why it is that Native Americans don't vote. Uh, and that culminated in a report, obstacles at every turn barriers to part political participation faced by Native Americans that I think there'll be a link to uh, in this session. It sort of goes through uh, the structural uh, prohibitions that are keeping Native Americans from voting and also how there's been a, a continual suppression of the Native American vote um, that is intentional discrimination across the United States. Uh, NARF also uh, and myself uh, conduct a lot of voting rights work. Um, so we do uh, ongoing voting rights litigation, including challenging North Dakota's voter ID law uh, in Montana. We challenge uh, ballot collection bans and bans on same day voter registration, uh, as, long, as well as other uh, cases across the country. Um, and uh, I also um, head up NARF's um, uh, Hill work. Uh, we have been doing quite a bit of advocacy to ensure that Native American voting rights are um, uh, acknowledged and are uh, part of the solutions um, that Congress is, is uh, bringing to bear uh, against the ongoing voter rights violations that are occurring across the country. Um, so we advocate for uh, inclusion of Native Americans. Um, we were uh, very excited to uh, have the Native American Voting Rights Act attached to the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act um, in this past uh, legislative session uh, and to see the continual ele elevation of uh, the issues that face Native Americans across the country. So uh, I do that kind of advocacy work on behalf of, of NARF Advancing Voting Rights. I think I'm next, Jason, yeah, in the alphabet. Uh, thanks uh, again for having me. And uh, it, it's an honor to be on a panel with such experts. I feel underqualified, but I will try to live up to it. Uh, my name is Adisa Demissi. I'm the uh, executive director of More Than a Vote, which is a, uh, a C3 and C4 organization started uh, in 2020. I can't believe I can still say last year. It feels like a long time ago. Uh, nonpartisan effort to educate, empower, inform and protect black voters as uh, they headed to the polls last year and again this year in some of these off-year elections. We're a coalition of about 60 black athletes uh, that came together really in the wake of the murder of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor is what inspired them to action and, and um, came together you know, around Memorial Day last year to say, what can we actually do to make change in real time and decided to focus on voting rights. Um, in the first instance. And so they've contributed their names, their likenesses, their platform um, to help uh, further our mission of educating, empowering, protecting black voters. Um, last year, we worked on a few initiatives, uh, sub with uh, some of the folks on this call, LDF, we worked closely with on an initiative to recruit uh, poll workers called We Got Next. We worked with uh, WNBA, NBA, other sports leagues to recruit young people, uh, young people of color in particular, to uh, in urban areas to staff up polling sites when we knew that the pandemic would uh, unfortunately lead to to closures if uh, if uh, in those neighborhoods and in those communities if uh, uh, if 
those polling sites weren't staffed. Um, we worked on uh, a project to open sports facilities and arenas uh, as uh, mass polling sites um, in Atlanta, Detroit, Los Angeles, uh, uh, you know, cities primarily with big sports teams and large populations of African Americans to make it easier and safer to vote during the pandemic. And and then towards the end of the year last year, um, uh, closer to the election, a anti-disinformation campaign, which uh, is unfortunately an epidemic in communities of color, um, but some of the most trusted voices in those communities are the athletes that are a part of our coalition. So um, we're really proud of what we did last year. This year, we've really focused less at the federal level, actually, and more at fighting the state by state level on both the information education side, but actually through our C4 advocating uh, against primarily the um, state level efforts to uh, suppress black votes, which I'm sure we'll talk about here um, more as we go along. So Honored to be a part of it. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to the conversation. I guess I'm batting cleanup. I'm Rick Hassan. And um, unlike the rest of the people on this call, I, I'm, I'm not in the real world. I'm uh, in academia at UC Irvine School of Law. My uh, area of scholarship focuses on election law, voting rights, campaign finance, redistricting, election administration. Uh, over the last few years, I've been focused especially on election administration issues, and in particular, the legitimacy of the election process and the risks to that process. Uh, so I wrote a book in 2020 called Election Meltdown about the risks to our uh, to public acceptance of election results, particularly in a, in a sea of, of disinformation. And um, the events of January 6, 2021 convinced me that there needs to be an even greater focus on this. And so uh, along with my colleague, David Kay, uh, we founded the Fair Elections and Free Speech Center at UC Irvine School of Law, where we're looking at issues of how to run fair elections and have vibrant contested elections consistent with free speech values and the First Amendment in the United States and around the world, uh, while still dealing with the threat of disinformation and particularly disinformation surrounding elections. Uh, so we've just gotten started. We had a, uh, a, a day-long conference on election subversion and, and the risks there. And we had different panelists, um, uh, both election officials and uh, experts in uh, transitions from democracy to authoritarianism and, and legal experts and political experts. We've also had three um, uh, lunchtime webinars on disinformation in American elections and another one looking at uh, information problems in elections around the world. Uh, all of these are available on the Fair Elections and Free Speech uh, website, and I will put the uh, link there. It's law.uci.edu slash F-E-F-S. And uh, I'm in, going forward focusing on issues about uh, how the information environment has changed the ability to run free and fair elections. And I have a book on that specific topic coming out in March called Cheap Speech how disinformation poisons our politics and how to cure it. So this is an issue that I plan on focusing on for the next few years. Thanks. Thanks everyone. And I, th I think a lot of you have hinted at the answer to this, this question, just diving right in. You, you know, we, we've talked about a lot of issues and a lot of problems, but if you had to identify what the greatest threat to our democratic system as you see it right now is, what would that be in particular. So we can just go around the around the horn here. Whoever wants to start first. Why don't we, why don't we start with Rick? So uh, as I just hinted in, in my introduction, I think the greatest threat uh, that we face in the short term is the risk of election subversion or election sabotage, the idea that we won't have peaceful transitions of power and free elections. And it's not something I ever expected to worry about in the United States. It's something that we see in emerging democracies, not in our, you know, very mature democracy. We never worried when a conservative Republican like George W. Bush was leaving office and, and a liberal Democrat like Barack Obama was coming in his place that Bush wasn't going to leave office. Uh, today, these kinds of things are a concern. And so uh, it, as dire as I think the voting rights situation is in parts of the United States, I think this risk of not having free and fair elections is really even uh, a more urgent problem, uh, especially as we think about the 2024 elections going forward. Thanks, Rick. Um, Jacqueline, what, what about you? 
I agree that there's, you know, this, this broad um, danger uh, coming from um, the imperilment of free and fair elections. Um, but I, I do want to, I do think that um, the intentional discrimination that continues uh, in a lot of instances unabated, and then um, I think helped by disinformation um, is uh, you know, a foundational threat uh, to our democracy. And so uh, when discriminatory laws are passed that are intended uh, in many instances to discriminate against a particular group. So say, for example, Native Americans in Montana um, had a uh, ballot collection, need ballot collection because they don't have uh, residential addresses on their homes and they don't um, get uh, mail delivered to their homes. And so uh, organizations pick up and drop off ballots uh, for them. Um, they also are impoverished and there, there are dirt roads and significant distances to post offices. And so, um, you know, there's these structural challenges and there's these common sense solutions. And, uh, you know, when ballot collection was outlawed there, we brought suit and uh, the court found that in fact, you know, Native Americans uh, needed ballot collections for their right to vote under their Montana constitution. And then uh, the very next legislative session, this 2021 legislative session, uh, Montana passed another ballot collection ban, despite the fact that uh, the state court had explicitly found that Native Americans would be discriminated against uh, in, you know, in this instance. And so um, that type of impunity, I think, um, that type of repression um, through legislative uh, means um, with the sheen of legitimacy I think is, uh, you know, foundationally problematic uh, to America. And, you know, I think that the fact that the conversation around voting rights increasingly um, is polarized, uh, that there is, uh, you know, a question whether or not um, the Voting Rights Act is needed and whether federal protections are appropriate um, is a problem um, that I think we need to uh, address head on. Absolutely. Uh, Amir, how about you? Yeah, I agree with both uh, Rick and, and Jacqueline. And I think, you know, at the, the root cause or the, the core of kind of the problems that they're both describing is this issue of misinformation and disinformation. Um, it's, you know, it, it, it has helped facilitate so many of the problems that we're seeing with respect to fr the lack of free and fair elections um, or um, the, the ability for um, state legislators, um, federal legislators, and election administrators to intentionally discriminate against black and brown voters. Um, and it's a problem that doesn't lend itself to um, an easy solution, which I think is probably a very obvious statement, but it, it, it's a problem that um, is pervasive and has allowed this big lie narrative to be pushed forward. And the solution really requires so many different actors to participate in a coordinated fashion that I think it's it's one of the greatest threats that we're facing um, with respect to voting rights, with respect to um, the structures and foundations of our democracy. Yeah, I mean, I uh, Amir took my answer. I agree. <laughs> but I actually agree with all, all three of you. I, only thing I will add is that there is a takeover of the actual you know, gears of election administration by agents of misinformation, disinformation, and election subversion is a real problem. Um, and it's happening in real time and it's happening, you know, in so many places that it is really difficult to, to stand in the breach when, you know, it's at the county level, it's at the state level, <laughs> in some ways it's at the federal level. Um, so, you know, it, it feels, it feels overwhelming in that sense. And I think the way, you know, the, I don't know the solution, obviously we'll talk a little bit more about what all of us are, are, are doing to, to stand in that breach. But I do think that there's a, there's a, a significant sort of um, challenge to, to thinking through exactly what, what we can do as individuals, what we can do as individual organizations to, to, you know, overcome this and feeling like that's not enough, right? Even, even understanding that without any one of us, any one of our organizations, you know, taking our piece of the puzzle and taking on one of the three things that Jacqueline, Amir, Rick all, all uh, laid out that that, you know, this isn't gonna get solved. So um, the overwhelmingness of the problem, I think in many ways is the biggest threat because we all have to keep doing it. We all have to keep pushing our, uh, you know, the ball uh, up the hill. And sometimes it feels a little Sisyphusian. Yeah, 
Yeah, thanks, Adisu. Definitely feel the same way. Um, let, let's let's stay on election subversion for um, a couple minutes here. Uh, Rick, you had mentioned, you know, as part of your work through the center, but also you have a, um, a I would say, pretty groundbreaking paper uh, identifying and minimizing the risk of election subversion and stolen elections in the contemporary United States, which I think really crystallized. Uh, the, the the problem and perspective solutions. Um, do you mind taking a few minutes and just describing what you, what you laid out as really the three paths to election subversion, just so we're all aware and we know what to watch out for? And then I'm going to ask you to to describe what those uh, methods that you laid out that that we all can do to minimize that that risk. Sure. So. Um... The paper, I've just put a link in the chat to the paper's uh, um, draft. Uh, the draft hasn't been updated because it's forthcoming in the Harvard Law Review Forum in April. So the revised draft will appear there and I'm working on revisions right now. Uh, the paper uh, really has three parts. The first part explains how we got here and how in the 2020 election, uh, we're learning more and more every day, how close we came to um, a breakdown of the peaceful transition of power. And so it's very easy to see how um, if those who uh, invaded the United States Capitol had been a slightly more successful and had been able to kill or capture some of the members of um, the congressional leadership or, or the vice president, uh, that we could have been in a situation of military rule and, and, and no vote being uh, taking place. Uh, also, if there were not certain heroes among elected officials and election officials um, who stood up to intense pressure uh, from Trump and his allies to say that the election was fraudulent and to send in purported alternative slates of electors to uh, Congress to potentially be accepted by the vice president, contrary to the rules of the Electoral Count Act, uh, or to have been accepted by members of Congress or to create some kind of stalemate whereby we go to an alternative voting system uh, for choosing the president where each house delegation, each state would get one vote, uh, a system that would have benefited Trump. So uh, the first part of the paper just talks about how it's very easy to see how things could have, have gone even worse than they did in 2020, uh, even with four Trump supporters uh, killed uh, and uh, 140 law enforcement officers injured, including one taste so many times they had a heart attack, another one with a brain injury. Um, looking forward, I think we can think of the 2020 election less as the nadir of uh, American democracy in the modern period, but instead as a dress rehearsal for 2024. And so the second part of the paper looks at three ways in which we might have subversion going forward. And the first, um, and um, uh, this was mentioned uh, earlier, is the possibility that the people who run elections won't do so fairly. Um, we have an unprecedented attack on election officials, not just to try to get them out of office. So for example, Brad Raffensperger, the Secretary of State of Georgia who stood up to Trump and refused to find 11,780 votes and try and flip the results uh, from Trump to Biden. He's facing a primary challenge from Congressman Jody Heiss who has said that, uh, embrace the big lie that the 2020 election was stolen and I should say, uh, at the outset, that there is no credible evidence that in any state the 2020 election outcome was stolen or rigged or unfair in any way that materially affected the outcome of that election. Um, Raffensperger could well be out of office. We could have the chief election officer of the state being someone who has embraced the false claims that the 2020 election was stolen. At the very least, that's going to cause many people uh, on the left to start believing what people on the right already believe that elections are rigged. Uh, but there's also the actual possibility of, of rigging elections uh, across the country as election officials face threats and intimidation and occasional violence. We see them leaving office. And in some cases, they're being replaced with Trump loyalists who have more allegiance to the um, person, Donald Trump, than they do to holding a fair election. Uh, the second path is, is a more likely path, um, but a, a kind of a convoluted one to explain, but it basically involves manipulating the rules that appear in the Constitution and the Electoral Count Act to have state legislatures potentially overrule the voters by relying on some pretext to send in a sham slate of uh, alternative electors. And uh, if, say, 
uh, Republicans have control of the Congress in January of 2025, that they would accept those alternative slate of electors, even if there's no good evidence that they would. Uh, this might require, or this might involve the cooperation of the Supreme Court in accepting something called the independent state legislature doctrine. And we can get into the details of that if there's time and interest. Uh, but even without that, state legislatures could potentially do this. Um, the Congress could accept them and we could have the loser declared the winner. Um, and the final path, and it's the least likely, but maybe the most terrifying, is actual violence against election officials, elected officials, or, or people voting at the polling place. And um, the number of people who think that our um, power, transitions of power are going to be resolved through violence is going up. The number of people who think that violence is sometimes justified in resolving political disputes is going up. And so it's a very volatile situation. Again, as I said in my introduction, I never expected to be worrying about this kind of thing in the United States, but I think you know we have to take steps to, to deal with that. And then the last part of my paper, which we can get into later if, if there's interest, talks about both legal solutions and political solutions to try to deal with this problem. There are lots of legal solutions, like uh, things that Congress should be able to come together on a bipartisan basis and agree on, like everyone should vote on a voting machine that produces a piece of paper that can be recounted in the event of a disputed election. We can't rely on a wholly electronic system without outside verification, given what we face right now. But it's also going to require um, uh, civil uh, cooperation uh, outside of the legal process uh, uh, among business groups, uh, 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 civic organizations, political parties, labor unions, um, there's a role of the free press. So I think we have to think about this as a, as, as a need for a societal uh, response, not just one that's going to possibly emanate from Congress. Thanks, Rick. And, and speaking of that societal response, just opening up to the other panelists, um, you know, with your organizations and the communities uh, uh, that, that, that you work in, have you seen, I would say, First of all, these examples on the ground that Rick laid out of, you know, moving towards, you know, prospective election subversion and, and how best do you see from a practical perspective moving forward to really implement these ideas to tackle this head on? I can, I can start out or Jacqueline, you can take it if you saw that you unmuted. <laughs> um, well, one thing that I wanted to touch on that, that Rick mentioned is um, this, the, the threat of kind of the infiltration of the ranks of local election administrators by individuals who are um, kind of promoting the, the big lie narrative and, and are pushing it forward and are bought into it. Um, and, and the threat that that presents to um, election results being counted and certified properly. Um, you know, we, in our work at PTVVRD, um, we, we work very closely with local election administrators, uh, both to kind of inform them of the issues that we're seeing on the ground, um, and then work collaboratively with them to, to figure out solutions to those issues. And the, um, w w what we are seeing is that uh, local election administrators are um, often very scared. They're receiving a lot of threats. They are no longer um, wanting to be in those positions and they're leaving those positions. Um, and that, that's something that we are directly seeing in the, in the work that we do. Um, and they're being replaced by folks that are less likely to work collaboratively with us to um, find solutions to the election administration problems that we're seeing, which are in many cases kind of the, the biggest reasons why folks are not able to vote on election day or during the early vote period. So that has um, that that presents a big threat to the work that we do, as well as the, um, the possibility that um, elections and election results will in some way be subverted um, in the future. So that's something that we're seeing on the ground and, and it's definitely something that we're looking at and concerned about. So I think um, I am certainly 
scared about the possibilities that Rick has laid out, right? They're, they are challenges that I think are on the horizon. Um, but taking a step back, um, I think a lot of my work talks about how um, fraud, right, is not in fact a problem in American elections um, and how the voter can be trusted. Um, and that, um, you know, we have to rely on um, an understanding of uh, our fellow Americans as, um, as uh, trustworthy and um, participating in good faith in the American system. And if we lose that, um, as we are uh, being threatened with now, um, there is this uh, backlash um, and that ends up creating barriers that make it more difficult for uh, communities uh, like Native Americans to vote. And so um, I think that, um, you know, this problem of um, undermining elections uh, and, you know, the, the um, um, uh, idea that elections themselves are going to become untrustworthy um, is uh, on the horizon, but it hasn't yet arrived and that we have to redouble our efforts in protecting um, the system that currently exists <laughs> and its legitimacy. Um, because um, when we concede um, the fraud narrative, uh, we lose, um, I think, um, a lot of, um, we, we, well, we just lose a lot of ground because it's untrue. <laughs> it's the, the, the bottom line is, is that fraud doesn't occur in the American system, that Native Americans and Americans across the country are voting in trustworthy ways and that election officials sometimes um, uh, can, uh, uh, are in positions of power, but can be trusted with that power. So we have to sort of balance those interests um, in our advocacy. Thanks, Jacqueline. Uh, Rick, I, I know that you know the the myth of voter fraud um, has has been a topic that's been around for for years. You've written about voting wars and and in other. Um, is this issue here to stay? Is this idea that the myth of voter fraud um, uh, is is out there? Are, are we going to be stuck with this now, or is there a way, as Jacqueline said, for Americans to just regain trust in one another. Um, you know, we'd like to think that it's just not a craven political play, but in some respects, I think you can chalk it up to that. So just curious your your thoughts on that. Well, I think things have really deteriorated in the current information environment. And uh, once again, I'm going to lay a big part of the blame at the feet of Donald Trump. Uh, claims of voter fraud are not new. Uh, voter fraud in the United States does occur it is extremely rare. Um, when it does happen, it's more likely to happen with absentee ballots, as we saw in the um, 2018 North Carolina uh, congressional race from the 9th Congressional District, where a Republican political operative, um, apparently, um, he's, he's going to be on trial next summer for apparently um, mishandling and potentially altering or destroying absentee ballots. So it does happen, but it's quite rare. Um, but um, if you look at current polling, um, majorities of Republican voters not only believe that the 2020 election was stolen through fraud, um, I think one of the most frightening polling results that I saw in, in recent months was a CNN poll, which showed that 59% of Republicans said that believing the voter fraud myth, believing that the 2020 election was stolen is a key part of what it means to be a Republican. That is, uh, as the base of the Republican Party has become more and more of a cult of personality, uh, what you end up with is a situation where um, there is a vast gulf in confidence in the process because people believe the, the false claims of fraud. Now, I think I made a major miscalculation uh, as I was thinking about what was going to happen in the 2020 election, I had expected that it would take some kind of mess up, uh, some kind of problem along the lines of what we saw in North Carolina or what we saw in the Iowa caucuses where there was a, a, a problem with, with, with the tallying of votes of the I Iowa Democratic caucuses in, in um, February of 2020. Uh, 
And I thought given COVID and given the challenges of trying to run an, a free and fair election in the midst of a pandemic, especially without adequate funding, that we were going to have one of those meltdowns somewhere and that this would provide the predicate for calling the election into doubt. So where I miscalculated was that I thought that there would have to be some basis of reality for millions of people to believe the false claims that the election was stolen or rigged. And Donald Trump proved that that's not correct, that in fact, it could be based on absolutely nothing but his supposition. Um, after the um, fake Arizona audit that took place uh, a few months ago, uh, which even this fake audit couldn't show that there were more ballots cast for Trump than for Biden, Trump still declared that it showed that the election was stolen. So actuality doesn't matter. And so these kinds of false claims, which serve to delegitimize democratic victories, because there's always fraud coming from Democrats um, when these claims are made, um, they not only serve for this delegitimization purpose, they not only serve to rile up the base and provide a basis for fundraising, but I think now they provide the predicate for a potentially stolen election, actually stolen election in 2024. Because after all, if you believe that the 2020 election was stolen from you, you're gonna be more likely to accept things that are not on the up and up in 2024. So I think we're in a very difficult situation. And I think what's going to make it even worse is that if we start having Trump loyalists being in charge of, cast, uh, of counting ballots and running elections, then there's going to be a loss of confidence on the Democratic side as well. And you know, what does it take to have a fair election? It really takes what uh, students of democracy call loser's consent. It takes the idea that, you know, I voted for my person, my person lost, and um, I feel bad about it, but it was a fair and square election and I'm gonna fight harder to win next time. If people don't accept that, if they don't accept the results as legitimate, it's very hard to have a functioning democracy. And so I think that not only is the myth of fraud going to be with us, but it tends to have an effect on both sides. It, it convinces those on the right that Democrats are stealing elections and it convinces those on the Democratic side that Republicans are, are trying to suppress their votes uh, or are now potentially trying to steal elections in order to counter uh, what they see as ha ha having happened in the past. So I've never been more worried about American democracy than I am in this period. And I don't think there's really anything in our lifetimes that, that has approached this. I mean, we've had terrible voter suppression in the past, um, but this concern about not being able to hold a free and fair election, I mean, this is something in the modern era that's unprecedented. Yeah. Thanks, Rick. Um, you know, this this idea of the myth of voter fraud has has led to, as you had said, voting restrictions and and voting barriers uh, as as well. And and Jacqueline, you had mentioned earlier, you, you helped write this extraordinary report, obstacles at, at at every turn. And you know, would you mind just taking a few minutes to walk through? Um, really some of the barriers that uh, that Native Americans face in achieving the franchise and, 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 and the ballot box. Sure, and thanks so much for the opportunity. You know, I think, um, honestly, Native American issues are, are often um, uh, left behind. And so I appreciate the opportunity to elevate sort of what's going on in our communities and has been going on for a very long time. Um, so I think there are two kind of big buckets that you can think of, of, of how Native Americans um, just are prevented from, from voting. And the first is just these structural deficiencies throughout their communities. So, you know, poor roads, poor, you know, lack of addressing, lack of um, residential mail delivery, distance to post offices. Um, and so, you know, it just is difficult, literally hard <laughs> to get your vote um, cast. And I think, you know, obviously, uh, there are things that election officials can and should do uh, to make that process easier. But the flip side of the coin, the second is that um, there are too often, there are at the state and county level, uh, people that are um, racially discriminating against Native Americans and intentionally discriminating against Native Americans, preventing them from accessing the ballot box. Um, and this is done, uh, for example, through denying an on-reservation polling place. Um, in this last 2020 election, um, you know, on the uh, Blackfeet Reservation, um, the county, Ponderay County said, oh, we're not going to provide on-reservation access because of the pandemic, uh, but we are going to provide um, in-person access to our county, um, uh, the county at the county seat. Now, the county seat, of course, was a 120-mile round trip, um, and Blackfeet Nation doesn't get residential mail address. 
uh, mail uh, to their homes. Um, and the county uh, was located in a city that was 90% uh, white. Now, you know, I think that what we see there is uh, a callousness. Uh, and in fact, when we negotiated directly with the counties, we would see, you know, racially motivated comments, things like, um, well, I don't want to get sick on an Indian reservation. I don't want to, uh, you know, I don't want to um, take those risks that I'm willing to take for a non-Native community in a Native community. Um, and so I think there is a, a deep-seated bias um, that occurs, um, and that also occurs, uh, for example, in San Juan County. We saw um, a elections official uh, commit fraud to keep a Native American candidate off of the ballot, uh, and he did so following a court order of um, of uh, districts um, that were shaped and designed to give Native Americans that were 50% of 51% of the county an actual fair um, uh, an actual fair opportunity to vote. So we see both structural deficiencies and we see uh, antagonism uh, in uh, counties and states that have large uh, Native American communities. Um, and so um, I think what the report lays out is uh, just the ways in which those structural deficiencies are, uh, can be taken advantage of and manipulated um, by county and state uh, legislators to keep Native Americans um, from voting. Great, thank you, Jacqueline. And I highly recommend the, the report for everyone to, uh, to take a look. You know, staying on the topic of, of the structural barriers and its impact on various communities for a second, um, Adisu, hoping that you'd be able to uh, tell us a little bit more about the efforts of more than a vote, um, you know, with the 2020 election and, and efforts to protect uh, the black vote and really to expand access. You had mentioned um, uh, combating various COVID uh, related uh, restrictions by opening up uh, um, arenas and recruiting poll workers. So hoping that you can talk a little bit more about the organization's response. Yeah, and it goes to my earlier point about trying to bite off what you can chew, right? Um, we are you know, led by athletes who are not lawyers or not litigators or not, you know, necessarily, uh, uh, they're certainly not academics like Rick. They are, they're, they're, uh, you know, famous athletes, but what they can do and what I think is in many ways, their responsibility, they feel is their responsibility is counteract the disinformation with good information. Right. And I think those of us who work in this space know the best antidote for mis and disinformation is provision of good information. But the challenge we have is, how do you disseminate it, right? Especially in a media environment now that is so fractured, that is so difficult to break through, right? It is, it, we are not getting our news from Tom Brokaw and Peter Jennings and Dan Rather, right? you know, every night at six o'clock anymore. It is uh, dozens of TV channels, social media, you name it. And so the responsibility that more than the vote has taken on is what we have is people that particularly black voters and younger folks listen to and they have massive platforms that can bypass essentially the media filter and go direct to voter, direct to uh, to folks. And so that I feel like is in, you know, there's legislation, there's litigation, there's election protection. We talked, I talked about how we participated in those partnering with groups like LDF, Brennan Center, others last year that bring that expertise. But the gap that more than a vote can fill is that information gap is how do you get information to people in this kind of environment? And so what we've done is tried to take a creative approach to content, you know, how do you, you know, make it interesting for people. Um, we, you know, very specifically a example I like to use is we did, uh, I don't know how many gamers there are on this, uh, on this zoom, but, um, NBA 2k, very popular game. One of the most popular video games in the country. We worked with NBA 2k and the folks who create that game to actually embed in the game information about, uh, how to vote last year and about voter suppression and why it's important and why it's important to overcome it using the voices of two of our, uh, our talent, Trey Young, a player for the Atlanta Hawks and Maria Taylor, a ESPN anchor at the time now at NBC. And so that is, uh, you know, a, a, a piece of the puzzle. It is by far not the biggest piece of the puzzle, but it is, it is a piece of the puzzle. And I think an important one that, as I said before, sometimes gets lost is that you can have the best laws, you can have the best, um, you can have good laws even that, that uh, you know, encourage people to vote, putting aside the, the um, voter suppression uh, that's happening at so many states across the country. But if folks don't know about it, if folks don't know how to exercise their rights, they're less likely to do it. And so that's the, that's the gap that we're trying to fill. 
And in, in turning to 22 and 24, how do you see that changing? I mean, you have all of these well-known and well-respected athletes. How do you see the message changing, if at all, to prepare folks for what's what's ahead? Well, I think one of the things that's an interesting honestly, it's a struggle for us sometimes is there's a, there's an understanding from prior research. And I think from common sense that you talk too much about how hard it is to vote and you're making it less likely for people to vote. But I think there is a flip side to it that I've certainly seen with the communities that the, with the athletes themselves and with a lot of the communities that they speak to, that it's actually motivating for people to have a, to have a, a, a hill to overcome, right? <laughs> An obstacle to go over. They're like, okay, you put a hurdle in front of us and we're going to jump right over it. You put a wall in front of us, we're going to climb over it. And so trying to figure out how to sort of message that has been a real uh, uh, challenge for us, if I'm being honest, and in, in, at More Than the Vote is we want to take advantage of that, you know, adversarial competitive nature that comes with people who both are athletes and play sports, but also who like sports um, and, and watch sports or play recreationally. Uh, without discouraging people. We've worked with experts. We've tried to talk to, you know, folks and figure out how to how to walk that line. But I do think, tactically speaking, I don't think it's going to change. I think what we need to do, unfortunately, is live in the world where we are. We don't know what that world's necessarily going to look like. We're still going through redistricting. There's still hope for the John Lewis Voting Rights Act in Congress, Freedom to Vote Act in Congress, et cetera. So what will these ele- what will things look like in September, October, November of next year? I, I can't say for sure. But whatever that landscape is, will be there to try to break through that noise and provide the right information to folks in states in particular, where the laws have changed since since 2020 and let people know how they can exercise their right and where those hurdles have been put up, how to jump over them. I'd, yeah. I'd love to just add a quick comment there. I just, you know, I'm, I'm so motivated by the work that you all do and, and just really appreciate it. And, um, you know, what we've seen and we've seen in throughout native communities is, um, you know, they're, they are suppressed and, you know, the barriers do lead to that suppression, you know, both because it's literally difficult to vote, but also because those barriers communicate to the voter that their voters not wanted, right? Like the, by the fact, by the fact, if you have to travel 120 miles to vote, you know, you're being pretty clearly told that this system's not f- for you. Um, but what we saw in places, for example, like North Dakota, where we spent, you know, uh, since almost 10 years, clearly articulating the injustice, basically getting it down to a sentence that said, the state of North Dakota knew that Native Americans did not have addresses on their homes and yet created a voter ID law that required an address on it in order to suppress your vote. Um, Native Americans could then, you know, throughout the state rallied, you know, they rallied hard. Um, in response to that clearly articulated injustice. Because an amorphous, very difficult um, to vote a system is just draining and exhausting, but a clearly articulated point about how you're being suppressed can really motivate people and provide resources and provide that sort of spark, I think, uh, to, to get turnout. The flip side of that, of course, is that it took us 10 years, millions of dollars, and, you know, and, and, uh, you know, uh, an expert that surveyed every uh, voter in North Dakota about their voter ID, um, and, uh, you know, litigation. Um, And so that, you know, is is the difficult part. Um, But I do think that that those types of sound bites um, are out there. Yeah, thanks, Jacqueline. It's, you know, educating and informing voters, you know, obviously the importance of that cannot be understated. And, you know, you mentioned photo ID and voter ID. And, you know, for those of us, all of us and those, you know, that are, that have, that have tuned in, that have done voter protection and election protection before. And Amir, you and I recently, uh, a few years ago, uh, back in Mississippi, um, one of the questions that you get pretty frequently on election day is, what type of voter identification do I need? Or I've been turned away at the polls because I, you know, I've been told I lack the proper um, I identification. So, you know, Amir, just turning to you for a second, you've been in the middle of election protection efforts for, you know, several cycles. And I'm wondering if you can, you know, um, 
describe really these these efforts both before and while at LDF, and and also tell us a little bit about you know your report, uh, Democracy Defended, which uh, again I highly recommend. I'm getting no you know no commission for recommending any of these reports or papers. They're just they're they are important and vital to our to the discussion. So Amir, uh, why don't you take it away? Yeah, sure. Um, I, you know, I think election protection and voter protection, both um, on the nonpartisan side and the partisan side, um, have become, have grown significantly over the past several cycles. Um, and I, I think, you know, at this point, and I, I anticipate for 2022, um, there will probably, probably be fairly um, organized election protection efforts, um, not only at LDF, but I'm thinking about the entire election protection network um, in all 50 states, um, which is kind of unprecedented. And Jason, you probably know this, being in the election protection world for, for several years, that um, you know the, the extent to which the effort has grown is, is really impressive. And I think a lot of it, like I said before, has to do with um, no longer having section five, uh, preclearance so that um, more and more groups are, are finding it necessary to enter this world to monitor, identify issues that um, are discriminatory against um, black and brown communities um, that would otherwise have been um, detected through the preclearance process. Um, so, you know, I think that's a, a positive development. Um, and on, L on LDF side, we in 2020, at our largest election protection effort um, in LDF's history, we operated primarily in 10 different states, most of which were subject to Section 5 preclearance before Shelby. Um, and we had over 1,300 volunteers, uh, poll monitors on the ground and remote uh, working remotely to identify issues. Um, and we worked with several local, state, national partners in the effort, so it was a a, a, a very large undertaking that um, involved a lot of groups, a lot of people. Um, we worked with Adisu and More Than a Vote to recruit over forty thousand poll workers to address the the poll worker shortage um, due to COVID. So there there was a lot of work put into that effort, and I only see that work increasing in anticipation of twenty twenty two and and um, eventually twenty twenty four. Um, through all of the information that we collected through our, all of our monitors uh, during 2020, we were able to put together um, this democracy defended report, which I'll, I'll throw the link into the chat um, in a little bit. But um, the all of our monitors collected information from polling sites um, across the states that we were working in. And this information concerned uh, voting obstacles, voting barriers that they identified that black voters and brown voters were facing in all of these states. Um, and we have a bunch of key findings that we have that we have published in the, the report that I'll let folks kind of go through on their own. But um, it's, you know, it, it, the report really highlights that although we did have um, a fairly smooth election from an election administration perspective in 2020, um, there were still very, very significant obstacles that um, Black communities faced during the election. And the, a lot of these obstacles are um, problems that lend themselves to solutions from an election administration perspective. Uh, some of them lend themselves to uh, a legislative solution. Um, and they are things that we are actively working on now um, in our preparations for 2022. Great, thanks, thanks, Mayor. Yeah, Jacqueline, just turning back to you, you know, this this idea of of, of voter protection or, or election protection, you know, what are some of the specific challenges to this in Indian country? You mentioned a, a variety of barriers, structural barriers, and obstacles that that are that are thrown out there. Um, but in terms of, of, of protecting the vote in Indian country, what are some of the, some of the challenges there? Do you mean, what do you mean by election protection? I'm trying to figure out. Just, just in terms of, of given the dismantling, and we'll talk in a second about section, you know, section five, section two, um, you know, in terms of, 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 of helping 
those in Indian country overcome those structural barriers that you mentioned earlier? What do you see as some of the challenges or some of the areas that, that need focus moving forward? Okay, thanks. Yeah, so I think, you know, I was, I was trying to think like on the ground and I was like, well, you know, that's really local specific, but I think more broadly, um, it, you know, litigation is facing some serious challenges right now. Um, and the reason is, is because of the Supreme Court's hostility uh, towards voting rights and its undermining of section two, um, and as well as its previous, uh, you know, uh, undermining of section five. Um, and, you know, Na Native Americans, um, when bringing section two cases have an over 90% success rate. And the reason is because our facts are so abysmal. And across uh, Indian country, federal courts recognize, regardless of which president appointed them, uh, that uh, Native Americans, uh, that these situations are just patently unfair. Um, but I think what was alarming about um, the most recent decision um, out of Arizona, um, at least from the American perspective, was this uh, workshopping of Section 2 um, that, uh, you know, Justice Alito uh, did uh, in order to sort of undermine the ways that um, advocates and, you know, just people looking to protect the vote um, use Section 2 in order to uh, advance rights. And so, you know, for example, particular to Indian countries is this dismissal of de minimis um, uh, 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 violations. So this idea that a violation could be so small and that if relative to the uh, minority population, it just doesn't count, even if it's discrimination. Um, the fact that, you know, they're accepting of this idea that discrimination could exist in the United States, that pockets of discrimination are okay, and that if it's just a few thousand votes, eh, well, a few thousand votes in a place like Arizona where the election was decided, you know, by uh, incredibly slim margins, um, really uh, translate to uh, disastrous co consequences. But I think also speak to a larger hostility uh, in federal courts towards fundamental uh, rights. And so, um, you know, we seek recourse in state courts, you know, currently suing in Montana instead of uh, federal courts. Um, uh, but, you know, in a lot of the places that we'd like to bring suit, uh, state courts are, are also hostile. And so, um, you know, I think that there is a, a big problem um, if, uh, as, you know, Rick's been pointing out, our system itself is at risk. And then if also our courts um, are at risk, uh, we are facing um, a, a perilous moment in American history. Thanks, Jacqueline and Rick. I'm gonna you 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 were mentioned, so I'm gonna put you now on on the spot. Uh, you know the 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 Bernovich case, right? You had you had stated, uh, I believe it was in the New York Times, uh, that the court via that case has quote weakened the last remaining legal tool for protecting minority voters in federal courts from a new wave of legislation seeking to suppress the vote. So more broadly, hoping you can describe really this particular opinion's impact on Section 2, um, future litigation under the Voting Rights Act, and, and really what that practical impact that we'll see. Sure. So if you go back to, say, around the year 2000, there were really three tools that uh, voting rights uh, plaintiffs had to attack laws that make it harder to register and vote. Uh, one is a constitutional claim under the Equal Protection Clause. Um, and uh, in a, a 2008 case called Crawford versus Marion County Election Board, the Supreme Court made it much harder to bring constitutional challenges, essentially making plaintiffs have a strong burden of showing that the, these laws are burdensome on a lot of people uh, and demonstrating it in a, in a, in a very non-speculative way but giving the state a pass on coming forward with significant evidence of voter fraud to justify such a law, even though we know that voter ID laws do not prevent an appreciable amount of, of fraud because trying to steal an election by impersonating someone else is a very dumb way to, to try to manipulate an election outcome. The second um, path that voting rights plaintiffs had for protection uh, was actually an administrative one. It was section five of the Voting Rights Act that said that Jurisdictions with a history of racial discrimination in voting uh, had to get approval from either the Department of Justice or a three judge court. And they had the burden of proving that the law wouldn't make protected minority voters worse off. So a state passes a new restrictive law, like Texas passes a, a very strict 
voter identification law that says the, the concealed weapons permit is okay to vote, but a student ID is not uh, pretty clearly uh, meant to suppress certain populations from voting. That law was put on hold uh, by the Department of Justice. And then in the 2013 case of Shelby County versus Holder, the United States Supreme Court held that the coverage formula, which defined which states and, and parts of states had to get this federal approval was no longer constitutional, an, a, another five to four decision. Uh, and in, in that decision, the court assured us, don't worry, there's always section two to protect voting rights. And then this past summer in the Brnovich versus Democratic National Committee case, uh, the Supreme Court severely weakened section two. So section two of the Voting Rights Act uh, doesn't just apply to certain geographic areas, it applies nationwide. And it says that um, states and, and localities can not pass laws that uh, looking at the totality of circumstances result in a situation where minority voters have less opportunity to participate in the political process and to elect representatives of their choice. And in the lower courts, this was a pretty tough standard to meet when it came to trying to challenge vote denial, uh, which, you know, laws that make it harder to register and vote. It was a little um, more well-developed in the vote, uh, vote dilution cases and the redistricting cases. But in the vote denial cases, in the lower courts, it was pretty tough to win, but sometimes you could win. And so that same strict Texas voter identification law, which was put on hold by the Department of Justice um, uh, and the three-judge court um, uh, until Shelby County, as soon as Shelby County's passed Texas implements its law, it was found to be a violation of section two and the Fifth Circuit, the most conservative court uh, appellate court in the country found that the law violated section two and the law was significantly weakened to make it easier for people who lacked the right kind of ID to be able to vote because of section two. In the Burnovich case, the Supreme Court didn't follow what lower courts had done in having a kind of tough standard to meet, but a doable standard to meet. And instead, the court in what I consider to be an act of statutory rewriting, putting up very heavy thumb on the scale, favoring states over voters, made it uh, very difficult to win a section two vote denial claim. As in the Crawford case, which was a constitutional case, the court put a thumb on the scale in terms of the state doesn't have to prove that voter fraud is a problem. It just has to assert it. And yet plaintiffs can't win just by showing disparate impact. They can't just show that, for example, a, a law that bans third party ballot collection to go back to the point that uh, Jacqueline was raising could have a disparate impact on people who live on reservations who might live hundreds of miles from uh, reliable postal service. The disparate impact wasn't enough. And instead the court, the court wouldn't enunciate a test but came up with five guidelines. And I count four of those guidelines as putting a thumb on the scale and fa favoring the state. And so I think it was not only an unfair uh, interpretation of section two, it is the kind of test that really severely weakens section two as a significant protection. So that means that we can't count on the federal courts to provide the kind of backstop for really egregious uh, voting laws that we did in the past. Doesn't mean that uh, after Brnovich that you could never win a section two case, but it has made it much more difficult. Thanks Rick. And then, you know, Jacqueline and Amir, so not revealing state secrets, but taking us into sort of the the, the corridors of LDF or, or, or NARF, how has the Brnovich opinion and this reconsideration of the, of the ability to use Section 2, how has that affected litigation strategy? And how do you see that moving forward with some of your current matters? I can jump in, but Amir, if you want to talk to that too. Um, you know, I think that prior to Section 2, or excuse me, prior to Brnovich, um, we were already wary of some federal courts, right? We had recognized uh, this disturbing trend kicking off with Shelby, which is what motivated us to seek state courts, um, uh, you know, which is why, you know, we're challenging the ballot collection ban and the ban on same-day voter registration in Montana in state court. Um, but you know, I, I do think uh, that we will continue to bring Section 2 cases. We're going to have to bring cases in federal courts, um, given the composition of state courts. Uh, and, you know, I will continue to rely on our exceedingly bad facts. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, I think that, um, uh, you know, 
that isn't to say that the, the standard um, hasn't been undermined because it has, that's disturbing. And I believe that there should be a congressional fix uh, so that there's a fair standard um, that uh, people can seek recourse under. Yeah, and just to, to hop on to that, I think, you know, I, I agree with, with Rick and um, Jacqueline. There are likely claims that would have been available under Section 2 uh, prior to Brnovich that will now be foreclosed by Brnovich. Um, they might be available under other provisions of the VRA or under the Constitution, but I think Section 2 has, has certainly been undermined by the, um, by the outcome in, in Brnovich. Um, LDF is litigating Section 2 claims in Texas, in Georgia, in Florida, challenging their um, omnibus voter suppression bills um, that were passed in the, in the past year or so. Um, and those cases will um, likely be um, some of the first cases in which federal courts are going to apply Brnovich um, in the wave of this voter suppression legislation that has been passed. Um, so I think it, it'll, it'll be important to watch how these cases go and how lower courts are going to be applying the Brnovich factors that, that Rick mentioned. Um, I think also Brnovich really raises the importance of um, good experts um, who play a really important role in quantifying the burden and, and um, demonstrating racial disparities um, that are caused by these laws. Um, so I think that that is something that we are paying special attention to and making sure that we um, are presenting um, solid expert evidence. I think one of the challenges here has been that um, there are a small number of experts uh, in this field who have the relevant experience testifying in these types of cases. Um, and uh, while those experts are, are excellent, they there's a dearth of diversity in that kind of expert field. So one thing that we're paying a lot of attention to is um, finding experts that um, are uh, represent kind of a more diverse field of, of um, the academic field that's out there um, and encouraging folks to get into that as well. So um, that's one thing that we're paying attention to as a result of Brnovich. Great, thanks, Samir. You know, we, we, we've been mentioning various, you know, new state laws and, and I believe uh, there's been, according to the Brennan Center, uh, 33 new laws in 19 states. Uh, since the 2020 election. Um, you know, curious, maybe Adisa, we'll, we'll start with you. Um, what state or states really do you have your, 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 your eye on? Um, I know the easy answer is, is, is all 19 of them. Yeah. Um, but, you know, for, for, for those of, you know, our, you know, individuals in the audience that, you know, might not follow this the way that we do. What are some of the examples that you all can can share of you know some of the restrictions in these in these new laws and what the practical impact of that might be? I think I mean, it it almost feels <laughs> futile to try to rank them. It's like they're all tied for first uh, in different ways. But considering the communities that I'm working most closely with, I don't know. I think Texas probably takes the cake. SB one. Um, you know, and thinking particularly from black community perspective, voter ID laws, reducing the number of, uh, you know, polling places, reducing the number of hours and actually early voting as well, which is something that increasingly African American voters have availed themselves of and in, in southern states in particular, uh, in, in the past few years, but um, Texas, Georgia, I think actually hits all three of those <laughs> as well uh, uh, with the law and that was actually the first one that more than a vote leaned in on. Uh, back in February as it was going through the state legislature and helped a bit to get um, uh, the NBA to focus a little bit on it with the All-Star game in Atlanta. And obviously MLB had the All-Star game move out, move out of Atlanta to Colorado because of it. Um, but yeah, those are, I mean, I think the there's so many different types of restrictions, it's almost impossible. There's restrictions on mail ballots, signature matching, voter purges, but the ID laws and the restrictions and hours, both on election day and in early voting, are things that I think are really surgically, to use the North Carolina case law uh, uh, language, targeted uh, at Black voters, and particularly in Texas and Georgia. Those are two of the places that we've been really, really focused on, both fighting the law before it was passed and signed, and now educating voters on what their responsibilities will be going into 2022. 
Yeah, I'll hop in just because I'm I'm litigating the, the Texas case, and um, I agree that that is uh, one of the most concerning laws that has been passed. And one thing that, that I think it's important to note about it is that you know in 2020, um, particularly in in Harris County in Texas, um, you know we saw that so many of the restrictions that are being placed now in SB1, so many the, the, those restrictions are being placed because. Um, are they being placed on methods of voting that were used disproportionately by Black and Latino voters um, in, in Texas, um, and particularly in Harris County? And that is, um, it, you know, it's very clear in the, in the record um, the, and, and the, the, the voting information that's out there. Um, so that law in particular is, I think, particularly concerning, um, not to say that the ones in Georgia, Florida, and all across the country are not concerning as well because I think they borrow extensively from each other. Um, but they're, yeah, the, the Texas one is, I think is particularly restrictive. I keep on bringing up Montana, probably because I'm litigating there. <laughs> and so it's just in my mind, but there are plenty others. Uh, you know, I think, you know, the reason that in Montana we're, we're fighting there is just because they passed a ban on ballot collection, like I said, that we had just uh, um, uh, fought the year before. Um, and uh, they also um, passed a ban on same day voter registration when uh, we've been fighting to have more access on Native American re reservations that are, you know, 120 miles from the county seat where they would otherwise have to register. And so if you get rid of same day voter registration, you tell somebody you got to travel 120 miles to register to vote, um, you know, and, you know, otherwise you can do that all on the same day. Uh, obviously, Native Americans would disproportionately use that method. And I think, I think just pausing for a second on how laws of neutral applicability are used to manipulate the system is important. So when we say something like, you know, we're not again, you know, we're, you know, we're going to fight against voter ID laws. I think that point often just gets manipulated to people saying, oh, you know, these advocates just don't want any ID. They don't want any security. No, what we're against is manipulating the rules around voter ID so that some people get the types of IDs that they have access to and other people uh, don't get to use the type of IDs that they get, uh, have access to. Um, and so manipulating, um, you know, or just, you know, saying all IDs have to have an address on them when, you know, you know that the Native Americans don't have addresses on their homes. So just writing out uh, or, you know, just signaling out and, and keeping specific groups um, from being able to participate in a reasonable way. And so I think that's sort of uh, what we're seeing across the board um, in these 19 states are these laws uh, that are seemingly neutral, um, but in fact are just targeting uh, specific uh, communities. Rick, is there any particular state that you've you've kept your eye on more than others? Well, I'm, as I mentioned earlier, focused on the election subversion issue. And so um, I was glad to see that in Arizona, a legislative proposal that would have given the state legislature the ability to simply overrule the votes of the voters in a presidential election for any reason whatsoever did not get a committee vote or uh, a hearing. Unfortunately, the person who proposed that a state representative is now running to be secretary of state of Arizona. Um, there, one dynamic that we're seeing, um, and this is true in both the Georgia and Texas legislation is you've got kind of a Republican dominated state legislature, Democratic dominated cities that have expanded opportunities to vote and the state legislature coming in and making it harder for the election administrators in those cities to do their job. So if you take Texas, for example, uh, the election administrator there who actually appeared at uh, the election subversion conference that I organized for our fair elections and free speech center, Isabel Longoria, she had instituted things like 24 hour drive through voting. Um, there's very little voting by mail in Texas, uh, but she made it very easy for people, you know, people who work all day, who can't spend an hour or two going to the polling place uh, uh, to be able to vote after work. And this new legislation makes it illegal uh, to do that. In, in Iowa, if a local election administrator tries to send out 
an application for an absentee ballot that a voter would fill out without the voter having first requested it, that could be a felony. Uh, so these are attempts by states to make it harder for local election administrators to ease opportunities for people to vote. And you know, the we have this very decentralized system where power is distributed between the federal government, state governments, and local governments. But um, generally speaking, local governments had the most control over how elections were done, kind of on the nitty gritty basis. You know, what voting machines were used and how long polling hours were. And now we're seeing much more state control of that, which which could be a good thing if it raises people up, but it's not a good thing if it's being used to suppress the votes of people who live in the cities, which is what I think we're seeing. Yeah, thanks, Rick. And you know, we're 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 coming up closely at the end of our of our time. Um, but you know, nothing like a a, a late Friday afternoon conversation about Congress. Uh, so, sort of shifting gears a little bit. You know, Rick, you just brought in the whole concept of federalism and you know control over uh, elections. Um, you know, it, it is pretty clear that Congress can address a lot of these problems. Um, including redistricting issues, which we haven't, but we can have a whole series of panels on, on redistricting. Um, but whether it's the John Lewis Voting Rights Reauthorization Act, Freedom to Vote Act, um, you know, Congress can address um, even attempts at subversion, cleaning up the Electoral Count Act. Um, what are some, and I'm not sort of, you know, in a perfect world, uh, you know, in your eyes, what are some legislative priorities that you would like to see Congress push um, and push in, in in short order? Well, for me, you know, I'm, I'm a supporter of the John Lewis uh, Voting Rights Advancement Act. I like parts of the Freedom to Vote Act, um, which uh, was the For the People Act beforehand. Um, but I think at the top of the list should be laws that are aimed at preventing election subversion. So I mentioned one thing, uh, which is the um, paper ballot requirement. I mean, that I think should be a no brainer, but there's fixing the Electoral Count Act, which is the arcane 1887 set of laws that governs how electoral college votes are counted. I think presidential elections in the United States are uniquely subject to manipulation because there are so many stages between the time that voters cast their votes for president and the time that those votes are translated into electoral college votes and, and are accepted by Congress. And so I think we need to streamline that process. And I'm hoping that there would be some bipartisan support for that, especially because given the claims of Donald Trump that the vice president has so much power to be able to manipulate the outcome there. Uh, what is Vice President Kamala Harris going to do in 2025? Maybe that would motivate some Republicans to look for compromise uh, on that issue. Uh, in addition to that, um, I think uh, we need uh, laws that increase criminal penalties for trying to for election officials trying to manipulate with, or others trying to manipulate vote counts. There's a um, uh, the potential for um, laws that limit the over of local election administration. Uh, uh, that's part, part of what's in the, the Freedom to Vote Act. And um, I think that we can think about laws that counter election disinformation. Uh, so I think laws, for example, that make it a crime to lie about when, where, or how people vote uh, are laws that would sustain constitutional challenge and would be a good idea. So we have someone who's now been indicted from the 2016 election who targeted messages to the African-American community uh, to vote by text, which is not a thing uh, in the United States. And we know about 5,000 people tried to vote by text. Whether they tried to vote otherwise, I don't know. But that kind of conduct may or may not be illegal under current federal law, but I think we need a federal law directly dealing with uh, efforts to suppress the vote by supplying misinformation about when, where, and how people vote. So th even though I think we need a, a, a new Voting Rights Act, it's, it's something that's extremely important. I, I think the five alarm fire right now is the risk of election subversion. So that's at the top of my list. Other other thoughts. I know Jacqueline, you had mentioned you know the the Native American Voting Rights Act being included in the Senate version of the of the John Lewis bill. Um, 
that's bipartisan, right? Um, can you maybe talk a little bit more about the importance of, of, of that to address some of the issues that we talked about? Yeah, so, you know, we were able to secure um, uh, Representative Cole's support in the House, uh, and then, uh, you know, who was a co-sponsor along with uh, Native American uh, Congresswoman Sharice Davids. Uh, and then uh, in the Senate, we were able to get that attached to the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, um, which uh, I think was a, a, a good recognition of the importance of this. Um, and Senate Mur Senator Murkowski has also uh, signaled her support um, for this. And I think I just want to pause for a minute on sort of um, what an achievement that was for Native Alaskans um, who, uh, you know, I think uh, in Alaska uh, turned out to vote for her during her ride in election and um, face uh, really ridiculous barriers uh, to voting in, in the state and continue uh, to, vote, to, to face those barriers. And so what the Native American Voting Rights Act does is mandate that there be uh, a polling place um, on a reservation or Indian community if, if um, the community wants it. And you know, that would be a game changer in some of these villages um, that have to really uh, travel uh, unreasonable distances or, or overcome unreasonable barriers in order to vote. And uh, her, her support for that is a reflection of the fact um, that Native Americans voted for her. Um, and so, you know, this type of, that, I mean, that's how America should work. Um, and I think, you know, this, this uh, responsibility of, of Congress uh, to be responsive uh, to its citizens and, and protect uh, the right to vote is, is urgent and compelling now. That's great. Thanks, Jacqueline. Uh, Adisu, what do, you, what do you have your eye on for Friends on Capitol Hill? I, I try not to. Um, no. Uh, Actually, I do want to take a second to talk about, because we did in the last section talk about the, the, the state voter suppression work, but there actually has been a lot of voter expansion uh, at the state level as well. I live in California, so I'm a little biased about this. Like we, we actually have made permanent all male voting, right? And we just had an election, the first major election after the 2020 election, the, the attempted recall of the governor out here that had higher turnout than the midterm election of 2018, because I think in large part, we sent everybody a ballot, no fraud, no issues, massive turnout. And California has one out of every eight people in America. So there are some good news. I think there are some good news things happening at the state level, right? That, and it's not just, it's not just California. There have been some red states like Indiana and Kentucky and uh, North Dakota, I think, uh, ease some uh, voter ID laws. So it's not all doom and gloom. And I, like I said, I've been more focused in my role at More Than the Vote is thinking about the state level because I think there's a lot of people focused on the JLVRA and and uh, and what used to be the For the People Act, now the the Freedom to Vote Act. Um, that you know, it's harder to fight 50 individual battles, but in many ways, that's where a lot of the action has been for the last uh, 11 months. That's great. And Amir, your thoughts? Yeah, just uh, piggybacking off of that, um, you know, one, one of the top uh, state level policy priorities of LDF has been uh, passing um, state level VRAs uh, across the country. And we saw that happening in, in Virginia. Um, there was uh, just this year, a, a state level learning rights act that was passed that um, the, the aim of which is to restore the protections that um, were eliminated under the, the federal VRA. So that, that's another thing that um, I think we can celebrate and um, that it, we are working towards expanding that effort and um, hopefully bringing it to other states as well. Um, <clears throat> on the federal level, you know, I think LDF is still very uh, focused on the um, Freedom to Vote Act and the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. Um, I, the question I think, Jason, that you asked initially is one, what, what is one thing that Congress can do um, I think that's for us to, to get rid of the filibuster, um, which will, I think, um, give us the, the highest likelihood of getting those two pieces of legislation passed. Um, so, I, you know, I think that's probably the, the number one priority from the uh, perspective of federal legislation on our part. Yeah, and for the record, I was not the one to first bring up getting rid of the filibuster. So there is there is now a transcript. No one can pin that on me. No, thanks, Amir. Um, we're, we're we're coming up on on the on the end of our time. Just you know, would would like to turn it back over to you all for 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 closing thoughts. 
um, you know, where, where are we going to be a year from now when we have our next, uh, when we have our seventh annual state of voting rights panel. Um, so just kicking it back over to, to you all, whoever, whoever wants to start first. Well, I'll say something. Um, I think that this is not the time for despair, but it's a time for activism and it's the time for fighting these battles state by state politically in state court in federal court in the court of public opinion. Um, our democracy is not lost, but it's under siege. And so I think the message has to be one of determination, not optimism, but determination. And that's how I'm trying to move forward as opposed to just seeing how, uh, you know, that things have gotten worse, but not uh, using that as a, as an excuse to stop trying. Yeah, I'll echo that. It's a hard thing to do, as I said earlier, to re remember we all have a role to play and we have to push forward. But this next year in advance of the 2022 election, so much is still unsettled. You know, re like I said, redistricting still happening, still a chance for federal legislation to pass. And I do have hope that it that it could happen in early 2022. Um, you know, everything, there's a whole nother state le legislative uh session happening across the country in 2022 before the election season starts. So I feel like to what Rick has been saying about the elect election subversion and also the voter suppression efforts that are happening out there, this is this year is maybe the most important year we've ever had <laughs> to double down on the efforts that we're doing and make sure that not only do we not lose get ground, but we gain, we hopefully try to gain not an insignificant amount of ground in terms of protecting people's voting rights. So it is you know, not not to be Pollyannish about it all. It's not, it's not going to be easy, but um, you know, we we will hopefully be here a year from now, saying that we actually made some. You know, we we regained some of that ground that I think we can all admit we lost uh, on the whole uh, since the 2020 election. And we do not we do have a democracy worth defending. <laughs> and Rick is not back here uh, uh, as as pessimistic and uh, about the the what it's going to look like in January 2025 as as we are now. Rightly so, to be clear, Rick. But uh, but I think there's hope on the horizon. And I'll also just echo that kind of note of uh, encouragement that I think, like I said before, in the election protection space, we've never seen the type of energy and participation in the election protection space like we saw last year and that we're seeing today. Um, and I think that that is reflective of kind of overall in the, in the voting rights space and in the democracy space, the, the type of energy that um, people are bringing to bear uh, to help protect our democracy and advance voting rights for um, those who's, who, whose voting rights have traditionally been um, attacked. So I think that there um, is certainly a lot to be concerned about. There's also um, a lot that is encouraging that's going on, and I encourage everyone to, to continue to be engaged and attend panels like this and, and continue to, um, to participate and uh, make your voice heard. Yeah, and I guess I get, I get to close it out and thank, thank everybody. But um, I guess I just want to say that for those that are concerned, uh, as we all are here, uh, that we can be clear sighted about the fact that intentional discrimination on the basis of race is occurring in America. That today, um, that Native Americans and uh, that uh, minority communities across America are being prevented from their free and fair access uh, to the ballot box and that we all have a responsibility as Americans to respond to that injustice, that we have a responsibility to uh, stand up and say that this is not the America that we uh, uh, believe in and that we have uh, the objective of making uh, the process fairer um, and more equitable uh, as America is intended to be. Um, and so I think that that message sometimes um, gets muddled uh, by this idea um, that there's, um, you know, that there's justification for um, making it more difficult to vote. And we should, um, I think, just all kind of get behind the idea that, that there's a lot of work to do, um, but that we have the tools and the America worth saving. You know, normally in the past, I, I close out with a quote, and it's not needed today. Um, you know, uh, want to thank you for, um, I mean, for for those of us, you know, everyone in the audience to listen to four of the leaders in this area and talk about the importance of our elections, of our system, how 
worth it is saving and what we can do moving forward um, is just something extraordinarily special and valuable. Um, I want to thank you for uh, all for attending and participating on this, this panel. Um, I would not be doing my job if I didn't engage in a shameless plug to join the ABA section of civil rights and social justice. They won't let me do one of these again unless I do it. No, I'm just kidding. Um, please consider joining. Uh, please consider uh, uh, viewing additional programs and participating and stay tuned. Uh, the section is going to be very involved in these efforts and ways to advance voting rights and combat election subversion. So on behalf of the section of civil rights and social justice, thank you, Rick, Adisu, Amir, Jacqueline. Um, have a great weekend. Happy holidays.